This is a complex topic, one that quite a number of people don't like me talking about because it sounds like a conspiracy theory. And this is about embalmers clots. And I'm just keeping you updated on the science. And in case you don't understand why I talk about it, it's simply because data was put in front of me at least over two years ago, which suggested that embalmers were seeing unusual patterns, forget the conspiracies. Then I thought that this was only occurring in people who had died. And then further information was put in front of me by a whistleblower showing me that it was happening in catheter labs in the living. And then I get information about the characteristics recently of um, data that came out about the origin of the virus. So what am I supposed to do? And then I have a doctor reach out to me who has also been seeing these unusual clots in some of his post-mortem cases. So for me, I have to look at it. It's inconvenient, I understand. But at the end of the day, there is a scientific responsibility to at least consider and reflect on what is happening. So what I'm sharing with you today is again another update because there are scientists who are working across the world who are looking to try and understand this. There are many scientists who have no idea this is occurring and there are even some who know it's occurring or don't believe it's occurring even though they've been told so. I can't do anything about that. But here is the latest information from Kevin McKernan and he did a video on it and I was given his um, information for me to look at. So I have just started the process of looking through it and essentially what he has found is that these clots light up under UV light they fluoresce. This is really, really unusual. It's not normal. That's the first thing. It's a, not a normal pattern. And the question is, what really is going on? So for those people who are willing to step outside the box and to look at some of these unusual patterns that are occurring, you would know that I just recently did a substack and this one had um, thousands of views, 263 likes, about COVID secrets they're hiding from you. This was a very important um, piece of information. I was woken up at four in the morning to be told this, and so I knew I had to share it. They really cracked through at 6,000 pages of data that was not supposed to have been found. And it really changes a lot of what we understand. And they were talking about these modified ORFs, open reading frames. And I was talking about that about a month ago. And the reason this is relevant is because we're talking about clots. And the connection is, this is, this is essentially what it is. You have to look at the substack to find some more, to get some more detail. But the essence of it, is that when you look at um, this paper, this is talking about the role of structural and non-structural proteins in SARS-CoV-2. And essentially they broke down the virus into the, the um, pieces in terms of the RNA, and this is what it would look like. And you can see here that the open reading frame, ORF1A, ORF1B, it shows you the full length of the viral um, RNA, mRNA. And then they have ORF3A, 3D, 6, 7, 8, 9, 14, 10. 10 is the one that we don't know why it's there. And 10 is the one, if you look at the substack, you will then understand why this is so important, is that the perception seems to be that this here, makes the blood more likely to clot. Um, that may sound strange, but the truth is the more that is being uncovered, the stranger it gets. But as I said, I've put the link in the description. You can go and look at what they have uncovered, the data, uh, they've got an initial document that you can read. They've got a short video explaining what they have found. 
this is pretty serious stuff. So when you put that together, you then can understand why we are seeing unusual patterns with regards to clotting. And just so that you have an understanding that this is not just random, um, two of our eminent researchers across the world, um, this is Professor Kell from Liverpool, uh, Professor Pretorius um, from South Africa, they have been studying fibrin um, fibrinoloid microclots for a long time. And in this preprint paper, they, are, they were highlighting a few important things about some of these clots. And the reason I'm mentioning this paper, that's a preprint, is because of a simple image in it that I think is very important for you to understand why I'm talking about fluorescence. When, you, when they looked at the data and they got here, they used a fluorescent microscope. They looked at normal blood and you can see that there is a little bit of fluorescence, but not much. This is it here. But in the platelet poor plasma, that means they took out the platelets, so it's not the platelets that are clotting. They're seeing this in people when you have spike protein added. So meaning that this is what it looks like normally, the same blood without platelets, you drop in spike protein and this is what it does. So these amyloid clots that they call microclots already light up. So we know that there is a pattern there that is very, very important and it could be tied to fibrin, but it seems to be more than that. And this is now where it comes to the recent research from Kevin McKernan. And so what he was finding here is that when they looked at these clots, and now um, before I, before I, in case you don't know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about these clots, I'm going to show you so that you can understand what it is that I mean when I talk about embalmers clots. Um, in this slide here that I did from a previous presentation, this is what it can look like. This is a very long one, 19 inches. He has got, this is an embalmer. I'm Richard Hirschman who's got it in a tube. This is a white fibrous clot, nothing like we really have seen before. And this pattern has never, well, I should say it can occur in heparin induced thrombocytopenia, but it's quite rare. But they are seeing this very often, not necessarily this big, but this is what it can look like for the embalmers. So we are trying to figure out, well, how is that possible? How is it that they can have a clot that is so big that it can uh, it can look like that. And so as I said before, my initial thought was that this was only occurring in the post-mortem state. But as I told you, there was a whistleblower. And if you are squeamish, look away now, because I'm going to show you what they have pulled out of a, a living person. And you can see here, this is all in the inferior vena cava, one of the big veins going up to the heart. And they are seeing white and red clot. And you can see this is an extremely long clot as well, extending all through with significant portions that are white. So this is not random. And this is why I'm saying is that when you actually see the evidence, you realize that we definitely need to understand what is going on. And so this is a process about updating you as to the most recent findings from people who are doing the science. As we come back now to looking at these big clots, so it's not the micro clots he's looking at now, these are the big clots that he's looking at. They put it under ultraviolet microscopy and they found that the whole of the clot fluoresces. It's uniform, it's not localized or spotty. It's moderate to green fluorescent intensity, suggesting that the entire structure contains an optically active modification. And even at four times magnification, they can see the fluorescence. It, it, it's, it's an unusual thing when you normally, so if, if you're in a dark room and you, you flick on a fluorescent light, you'll see some things will light up and they will glow like um, neon. But this doesn't normally happen in, in blood. And when they looked at it, they had to then try and think about, well, 
what products are there that will normally fluoresce? And this is what they found. So fluorescence does exist in the human body. So there are several biomolecules in the human body that exhibit natural fluorescence, right? The main things are NADH, nicotinamide, adenine dinucleotide. This is essential in terms of energy transfer. Certain flavins will light up as well. Um, certain um, amino acids, tryptophan, tyrosine, as well collagen. Certain collagens can light up. And the hemoglobin can light up as well. Now, from my previous research, when I had looked at the clots, when they had done the protein analysis, we found there was a high amount of hemoglobin in it, as well as fibrin and some other proteins. And it's possible that because this was not red blood cells, this was free hemoglobin that seemed to be concentrated in these clots. And my only thought is that because spike protein also binds to free hemoglobin, this was one of the mechanisms that got all of this concentrated together. This is very complicated. It's firstly important to note, we've not seen this before, not certainly in this kind of um, extent. And it's disappointing that we have less, so little interest from the scientific community especially in an environment where we know we're seeing more clotting than usual in patients and there is no clear mechanism and we know as well that in long covid type patients they also have clearly documented small microclots and what we're not sure about is whether or not those microclots can then become big macroclots based on my research um and based on my observation, my thought is that when we, when we look at the big clots that occur that can fill up the whole of an inferior vena cava, because we regularly do angiograms um, in hospital and we don't see that kind of clot regularly, it suggests to me that this is occurring relatively quickly. And the reason the embalmers are seeing it is because if these patients who have these clots don't get urgent intervention, they could pass away. And this is why an embalmer would see it, but not necessarily in routine scans. It's a very important point. So when I had looked at the, the data and the research, I came up with, in my opinion, what is called white clot syndrome. It can occur, it's not a new condition, but it's usually tied to the use of heparin and it triggering an autoimmune response and then forming these very big white clots. It's quite a serious condition, doesn't happen very often normally. So my proposal is that this is part of a quick autoimmune process that can then form these clots in a very short period of time. People then get very sick quickly. And if there is no intervention, they can die. And then that's why embalmers would see it. And when I listened to some of the cases, especially from the, um, the doctor who was doing autopsies, one of the cases where he found a foot long clot um, in the inferior vena cava, the patient had only been unwell for two days before they collapsed and died. So it very strongly suggests that this is likely to be a quick and potentially, in my mind, an autoimmune response. But we are just starting to uncover some of the mechanisms that are there. And, and just as a final point on this, when we look at the possible interpretations the um there is advanced gly um and glycolation in products that can light up and um, that was one of his hypotheses from kevin mckernan then there could be hyperphosphorylation um where there's excessive phosphorus being included in the clots which could then cause this his um third hypothesis was about the incorporation of tin for some reason tin is found in these clots in very high um, concentration not quite sure why and as well um, then he said four is to 
quantify and confirm the source of this autofluorescence. So we do have experts across the world who are quietly working at this, looking at this, trying to understand this, trying to figure out ways that they can protect the population. And this is why I said the more that I look at the research and the more that I see the implications possibly of a combination of spike protein circulation and clotting triggers like ORF10, which possibly makes the blood more prone to clotting. We don't know, but something isn't right. And if we can understand it, there may be a chance that we have to mitigate it. That is fundamentally what I think that we have to try and do. So, and in conclusion, just remember, if you haven't yet seen this video and this um, article, this is extremely important when it comes to trying to understand what may be going on. We're just starting to hear more about these documents. And these documents are so important that the scientists who discovered it put a kill switch on it, meaning that if something happened to them, it would be disseminated immediately all across the world. That's how serious this is. And that's how important the implications are. So please take a look, reflect on the video, look at the document, make up your own mind. But more than ever, everybody needs to be educated about what is going on. Some of the information I talk about is actually pretty serious. And it's hard for me to say, have a good evening. But the truth is, is that I am happy that we are looking for answers. And it's not the information that you must be concerned about. But be happy that not everybody is ignoring this. And there are some people who are trying to find solutions for you and your loved ones. Have a great evening.